This is the fourth and final video of the effect size tutorial series that I've been making and this one will be focusing on non-parametric effect size indices. So generally parametric tests and procedures have been developed far more than distribution free tests and thus there is a much smaller range of procedures and much less flexibility when using distribution free procedures. Distribution free procedures is another way of saying non-parametric procedures. Leach and Onwigabuzi, I'm really not sure how to pronounce the surname of that, but I'll just keep saying Onwigabuzi. Note that researchers who employ non-parametric analysis generally either do not report effect size estimates or incorrectly report parametric alternatives such as Cohen's D. Cohen's D was covered in the first part of this tutorial series and you can check it out if you're interested. As measures of effect size within the D family are adversely affected by violations of normality and heterogeneity of variances, they are not well advised for use of data which violate these assumptions. As Leach and Onwego Buzi states, reporting effect sizes is no less important for statistically significant non-parametric findings than it is for statistically significant parametric results. There are several non-parametric effect size estimates, but they are generally not well known and they are generally not available in typical statistical software packages, such as SPSS and Stata. So starting with between group designs, Grissom and Kim have suggested some effect size estimators for use in association with non-parametric statistics. For the two group independent samples design, they suggest that one obtain the man whitney u statistic and then divide it by the product, which is the multiplication of the two sample sizes. This statistic is useful as it estimates the probability that a score randomly drawn from population A will be greater than a score randomly drawn from population B. And this is symbolized as p hat a dot b. The formula for p hat a dot b is simply u divided by the product of the one sample or sample size for group A times the sample size of group B. Additionally, when calculating a man Whitney U test, as well as the Kruskal Wallace H test, which is the non parametric alternative to a one way ANOVA, it is possible to calculate R using this formula. R equals Z divided by the square root of the total sample size. And as mentioned in the part two of the series, R is by itself uh, a valid measure of effect size. For more information on that and how to interpret it, watch part two of the video series. So moving on to a worked example. Suppose we want to test the continuous variable of the left-right percentage difference in the L3 multi muscle cross-sectional area against the binary variable of injured or not injured. However, we find that the data are not homogeneous, and so we are required to use the non-parametric equivalent, a Mann-Whitney U-test. After calculating the test, we get a Mann-Whitney U-statistic of 42, U equals 42, and our sample sizes are 16 for injured and 10 for not injured. To calculate the p hat a dot b using the formula shown we simply need to divide the u statistic which is 42 by the product of the two sample sizes 16 times 10 which gives us a p hat a dot b value of 0 0.26. Additionally when calculating a man u, stist u test as well as the Kruskal Wallace H test the non-parametric alternative to one way ANOVA, it is possible to calculate R using the R conversion formula. For instance, suppose you want to test whether there is a difference between individuals with no injuries, N equals 10, and lower limb injuries, N equals 11, and the left-right percentage change at L4, multi muscle. We would calculate a manual Whitney test, and which is again the non-parametric alternative to the independent samples t-test and is assumed that when testing for this difference we get a z-score of 1.66 we would simply square root the total sample size 21 because 11 plus 10 equals 21 
which gives us a value of 4.58, which is the standardizer slash denominator by which we divide the z-score of 1.66 by. This gives us an R correlation coefficient of 0 0.36. Moving on to within group designs. So for the two related samples design associated with the binomial sign test and the Wilcoxon sign rank test, Grissom and Kim recommend the PS DEP effect size index. The prob this the PS DEP index represents the probability that in a, a randomly sampled pair of scores, the score from condition B, the condition which most frequently has a higher score, will be greater than the score from condition A, the condition which most frequently has the lower score. So when computing either the sign test or the signed rank test, we f first find the BA different scores. And to obtain the PS dip, we simply divide the number of positive differences scores by the total number of matched pairs. And if there are ties, we can simply discard the ties, which reduces N, or add to the numerator one half of the ties. As long as you mention what you've done, it's a valid way of calculating the effect size. Here's the formula where N plus is the number of positive different scores. Uh, moving on to a worked example, suppose you want to investigate if there is any difference in the L4 multi PD muscle cross-sectional area measured in millimeters between the left and right arm sides. We have 26 matched pairs and so we would need to calculate the number of positive scores N+, plus, which for this example data set would end up being 11. So just to discuss how we can calculate that N+, plus, here's an example table. So, on the first column we have the L4 multi -feed on the right side, measured in millimeters. And on the next column we have the L4 multi -feed on the left side, measured in millimeters. Then on the next column, we simply calculate the differences between these scores. So 601 minus 592 gives us 9. Now this would be a positive score, so we add 1 to our N plus score. And then we continue doing it for each matched pair. And then for each positive difference we find, we add one to the N plus. And for this data set, we end up getting a total number of positive differences of 11. So our N plus score would be 11. So to calculate the PSDEP, we would simply divide the total number of positive scores, N plus equals 11, by the number of matched pairs. In this case, it's 26. Now, this gives us a PS depth score of 0 0.42. So, moving on how to interpret these results. So, as p hat a dot b, which is also known as the probability of superiority, provides an estimate of the probability that an individual from group A would have a higher score than an individual from group B and we calculated a p hat a b value of 0 0.26. This allows us to know that there is a 26% chance that a score randomly drawn from the injured group, group A, will be greater than a score randomly drawn from the non-injured group, group B. So, and then using the R conversion formula, Cohen's 1988 rule of thumbs for interpreting R is still applicable. To see the interpretation for that, watch part two of this tutorial series. And however, as we mentioned throughout the series, it is preferable to compare your effect sizes to previous literature as opposed to using only Cohen's rule of thumb for interpretations of the magnitude of effects. Lastly, for PS dip, as it is with a, a within group design alternative to P hat A dot B, our score of 0 0.42 allows us to draw the conclusion that there is a 42% chance of the cross-sectional area of the right side being larger than that of the left side at the L4 multi -feed muscle level. And then a possible way of tabulating your results could be as shown here, where you have the two different groups, the number of samples in each group, and then importantly for non-parametric designs, instead of using the the median, the average, I mean, yeah, the mean, the average, and the standard deviation as descriptive statistics, we would rather use the median and the range 
because non-parametric results and statistics are generally based on ranking so the mean rank wouldn't really mean much but the median rank means or has much more significance to interpreting the results and then we simply put the, the overall significance level as well as the specific effect size instances that's used. Thanks for watching this video and I hope this tutorial series helped you to understand the different effect sizes that can be used and how to use them in your own research.